Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. The future of PC gaming is going to look very different for a plethora of reasons over the next couple of years. Perhaps one of the more exciting reasons, though, is that low-end discrete GPUs for both desktop and mobile are going to be all but rendered obsolete as super powerful APUs are released, which pretty much just takes their lunch money. And we're going to be discussing Phoenix in this very video, as its performance targets allegedly are above the RTX 3060M. And we're going to be discussing it right after this message from the video's sponsor. Did you just build a shiny new PC? Then you'll need a genuine copy of Windows 10 so you can personalize the system and of course get rid of that annoying activation watermark. We've partnered with WhoKeys to give you guys great discounts on Windows 10 keys and of course they can be fully upgraded to Windows 11 too. You can get 30% off using the coupon code RGT during checkout. I've purchased several of these keys in the past using a personal non-RGT affiliated account and they've worked flawlessly with quick delivery. If you want to pick up a copy of Windows for as little as $15 or a cheap and legit copy of Office, check the links out in the video description below. AMD's APUs have been a really interesting topic that I've been covering extensively on the channel recently. Just over a week ago, I had an exclusive detailing Phoenix as well as AMD's Raphael H. Speaking about Phoenix though, I had mentioned that the performance targets were very impressive actually designed to replace and pressure NVIDIA's lower-end desktop SKUs such as the RTX 3050 and RTX 3060 M, and even outperform desktop SKUs rather handily, may I add, such as the RX 6500 XT. Recently, Grayman on Twitter actually backed up my information. He said that he's been hearing, yeah, RTX 3060 M is definitely the target for these uh, APUs. And quite frankly, it's no wonder if you look at the specifications. According to what he's mentioned, yeah, six workgroup processors is indeed what we're going to be seeing. Again, backing up what I'd mentioned in my previous video, 1536 shaders. To my understanding, we are looking at a SKU which can hit over 3 gigahertz for the iGPU. Which, when you think about it, is kind of nuts when you think, you know, just how much performance that actually is. To put it in context, you're not that far away from the next generation, current generation consoles with that. You're hitting, you know, mid 90 flops. Again, that will depend probably on things such as the cooling of the laptop, what time of the day it is, the angle of the sun and the moon and all of the other things which go into pro providing, you know, boost frequencies for an iGPU slash GPU. But it is rather tantalizing. Further to this, though, I've been hearing a little bit more information. Now, you can see on my previous slides that, yeah, it is going to be at CES, and this is going to be allegedly where it's going to debut. Grayman has also said much the same. But eight Zen 4 cores are what we're going to be seeing here with the L3 cache 16 megabytes. You can see that my previous slide, though, well, I said that iGPU cache was larger now I've been told that it's actually double. I'm assuming that this is in reference to the L2 cache. Unfortunately, there is no infinity cache with this. So you're going to say to yourself, well, gee golly, how the hell are we going to power this thing, right? I mean, it's all well and good having a GPU which is really powerful, but if you can't supply enough data, what does it actually matter? Well, I'm glad you asked. And I'm being told that the way that this is actually going to be receiving enough data is from really fast memory. You can see that my older slide mentions LPDDR5X, but I didn't reference the frequency. Well, apparently it's going to be 8500 MTS, which is a really fast data rate. In fact, that's kind of obscene. Now, to my understanding, the memory controller of Zen 4, just as a general reference point, is really good. So the desktop version of Zen 4, I'm being told, could support up to 5600 MTS, which is really fast, although one of my sources insists it's not quite that fast, it's going to be 5200. So I'm going to put both figures in this video, because I think that's probably the best way. But either way, um, 8500 MTS is absolutely obscene. I've only had one source tell me it's that fast, however I've had multiple sources tell me LPDDR5X is going to be supported. Further to this, it's going to feature up to 24 PCIe Gen 5 lanes, possibly 20. 
And as for the actual size of the die, it's not that big really. It's going to be around the same die space as Rembrandt, which makes sense given a plethora of reasons, not least of which that it's going to be a mobile first design. 3 gigahertz does still seem to be the iGPU clock, and yeah, boost frequencies up to around 5 gigahertz. I'm assuming that this is going to be only single core with possibly the clocks scaling down a little if you're loading up all of the threads. I'm sure you'll agree though that this is absolutely ridiculous and it really does mean that Nvidia are going to be put under tons of pressure for the desktop SKUs. I'm sure that they'll do their best though to kind of refine their design so that we have more powerful GPUs in the future. It's also going to be also curious to see how Lovelace RTX 40 scales with lower power environments as well because we're hearing like 600 watts for the desktop skews so i mean obviously you're not going to see the same number of cuda cores for a mobile solution but what's going to happen for a card that's let's say got a target of like you know low 100 watts that's going to be really interesting um also while we're on the subject of amd and zen i'd like to just mention that zen 5 to my understanding at this point is going to be produced on the tsmc 4 nm process along with rdna 4. now i'd actually referenced this in a couple of previous videos but then i got told that this is not right by a couple of other sources but now more recently even they've switched to telling me that it is only going to be 4 nm however these are really customized processes from amd so it doesn't really matter to be honest with you like it could be Obviously, I'm being really silly here, but it could be on like on a 28 nm process for what it matters as long as it performs correctly. Um, and both AMD and uh, Nvidia are doing a ton of stuff to customize the processes from TSMC. So, to my understanding, there's a Digi Times article that also states that Zen is almost certainly Zen Five, to be clear, is almost certainly going to be using the TSMC 4 nm process, and I think this is most likely. Quite honestly, I'm kind of expecting AMD to announce this at one of their upcoming conferences soon, but I don't know. We'll see. Uh, speaking of Flow TSMC, just real quick on that, there's an actual rumor. This has been posted on the AsianTechPress.com website. I'll, of course, link it in the video description. That AMD are intending to pay 6.5 billion, I'm going to repeat that, 6.5 billion to TSMC, Global Foundries, and others. Basically, this is just for the rest of the year for chip capacity. I feel that there's a really big story in this. I mean, NVIDIA, I've already covered a couple of times now on the channel, has paid around 10 billion to TSMC for the 5NM process, or more accurately, its custom version of the 5NM process. I believe it's going to be the 4NM process, kind of. Um, so, yeah, it's... You know... AMD, NVIDIA, all of these companies like Apple, they are great. You know, they definitely push the, the industry forward. But in many ways, TSMC essentially, they're basically the epic of hardware. You know how epic games basically have the Unreal Engine, which is just synonymous at this point with, well, gaming and a plethora of other reasons. I don't know what is meaning the word plethora today, whatever. Um... And yeah, I think TSMC are essentially kind of going the same route. Like, their manufacturing processes are just so profoundly above the competition. Hopefully Samsung and others can catch up. And obviously Intel are also getting into the manufacturing game, which is, again, a whole story in and of itself. But yeah. Um, one final thing before I close out the video, because I just wanted to talk about this really briefly... Uh, if you're not interested in console stuff, you can close out here. But I just want to quickly discuss the whole Xbox DRM situation. Now, I'm not going to really discuss this too in depth because, quite honestly, there are a ton of channels which are going to be covering this much deeper than I am and much more extensively and perhaps more nuanced. But I will say from my point of view that, um, you know, I, I do feel that the situation isn't really where it should be with Xbox. And I feel that there should, at the very least, be some type of grace period for if your Xbox cannot 
access the licensing servers. Now, I don't know what that grace period would be. I personally think at least a week. Two weeks would be ideal. Possibly even a month. But yeah, um, I I think that this is not a good look for Microsoft. And, you know, even Sony's implementation of this has not been perfect. And honestly, Sony themselves have had a number of screw-ups. I'm sure you remember the numbers of times that PSN was down and when they got hacked back in the day. No company is perfect, but just my two cents on this, I feel that they definitely need to kind of rethink this strategy. As, again, in my personal opinion, this is not a good look. Um, but that's just about it for this video. It's been a little shorter than what I anticipated. Uh, I'm still recovering from my plague. I'm feeling a lot better than I was, but still not 100%. Um, but yeah, for everyone who has been asking about me and stuff, yeah, I'm good. It's just been a really heavy cold and it's not been... Well, let's just say it's not been fun. But with that said, thank you very much for watching the video. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.